Church, what a joy I have to be able to introduce to you our guest preacher this morning. Uh, if there was ever a time where that cliche, this person needs no introduction, would be true, it is certainly in an introduction of Dr. Gary Fenton here at Dawson. Many of you know that currently Dr. Fenton serves as a senior advancement officer at Sanford University. Prior to this role, he, along with Alta Faye, for 25 years served so faithfully here at Dawson. It is not an overstatement to say that his fingerprints as a faithful pastor are present in every aspect of our church. So many of you love him and know him as a pastor who knew you, knows you, and loves you. Over a year ago, Dr. Ben Hale and myself were talking about the preliminary plans for this Sunday, and it was evident to both of us that there was no better person to preach this morning than the person who led you as a church to go love and to tell. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Fenton as he opens God's Word to us this morning? It's good to be back with you. Thank you, Pastor David. Thank you for the many kindnesses and courtesies that you and Danielle have extended to Alta Fe and to me. Man, we have a great pastor, don't we? We are so blessed to have uh, Pastor David as our leader. Five years ago, we first started talking about Go Love Tell. And some of you who were here remember how generally we started the emphasis, five years, five locations, five projects, five million dollars. And by the time we were through with it, you were sort of saying five, and that was about what, what you remembered. But when you think about what's happened in those five years, wow. We've gone and built hospitals, schools, built churches. You've taken mission trips to support the ministries there. You have provided so many resources. And when you think about all of the people that's been involved, you think about every donor here, that gave money. You think about every volunteer that went. Wow. When you think about all of the partners that we volunteered with, it's literally been a cast of thousands. And we could not, we could not have done it without the planning and the preparation of Dr. Ben Hale and Tom Thompson. But when you think about what all happened, those five projects, turned into 13 projects. That $5 million that we were hoping to raise, you gave nearly $6 million and probably will give $6 million before, before the month is over. You have surpassed every expectation, but God kept His promises all during the process. To God be the glory. Great things He has done. It's such an exciting opportunity to be a part of something so big, so great, and so important in the kingdom of God. But for a few minutes, let's think about why in the world did we do this? Why did, why did the church ever get involved in this? Well, let's look at a verse of scripture that may help us. Turn with me in your Bibles. So John chapter 17, verse 26. This is Jesus speaking to the Father. It's, it's part of his prayer. And he says, I have made you. Now, this is Jesus. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me 
may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. May God bless the reading, hearing, and obeying of his word. Back years ago when I graduated from seminary, Altafe and I finished everything. I think graduation was at 11 o'clock and around noon, we rushed back to the house to pack everything up that we owned, which was very little. On first thing on Saturday morning, we left driving for Branson, Missouri from Fort Worth, Texas. It's about a 450 mile an hour, a 450 mile drive. When we arrived in Branson, it was late in the afternoon. We got a little bit of rest. And the next morning, I began serving my first full-time pastorate at Branson. The service, it was a filled service. The adrenaline was running in me, and man, I was excited to be there. There was a small little reception for us that afternoon. That evening, we gathered back for an evening service, and When that last amen was said in the service, and of course people were standing around to greet, I was absolutely exhausted. And Altafe went back towards the car, and a deacon comes running to me, and he says, Pastor, Pastor Fenton, Pastor Fenton, he says, did anyone tell you that uh, we plan vacation Bible school to start tomorrow? Well, nobody had told me that. I said, no. He says, well, they probably didn't tell you that uh, you're the the director of Vacation Bible School. No, they didn't tell me I was the director. And he said, "Uh, now there's a a little booklet on your desk that tells what the director's supposed to do. But you probably know all of that. I'm sure you covered that in in seminary. No, we didn't cover a Vacation Bible School in seminary. It had been 15 years since I'd even been a student in Vacation Bible School. And... He said, and one more thing, before you leave, you, you'll need to be here at 7 to let a few teachers in because he says they don't get here, they, they haven't got here during the week to prepare their rooms. And so he said, you'll need to be here at 7. So I went back in my office, found the little booklet that explained what I was supposed to do, got up the next morning, led the, the opening se- assembly, and it said that the If you were the director, you needed to visit each class. Well, I visited the first class, and then the third class I visited, there was a little boy in it, and uh, as soon as I walked in the room, he was going, Pastor, 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 Pastor. And I said, well, when they call the group to order, I'll let you ask your question. First, you tell me your name, and then you ask your question. And so when they had called the group to order, and he says, my name's Kent, and my question is, what is God like? Well, remember, I'd just finished seminary 72 hours before. I'd taken my oral examination probably 100, 110 hours earlier just, just to get, and that oral examination, one of the things you had to do was remember a description of the work of God. And so I started pulling that together and I said, well, God is eternal spirit who created all things in heaven and earth. He is fully known through the incarnation of his son, Jesus the Christ, to whom we are accountable for all our deeds. And I looked at the young man, I said, does that help? And he said, no. He said, it didn't help at all. And his teacher said, don't embarrass the new pastor, Kent. Later found out that was his mother. And, you know, she said, and the longer I thought about that and the process that through, process that through my mind, it was a great question. Every preacher needs to know what God is like. Every Christian needs needs to know what God is like. For Jesus said, I have made you known. Jesus was the Son of God in flesh. And he says, and I will continue to make you known. And how does Christ continue to do the work today? Through us, the body of Christ. Because we're to make 
the world understand or to present to the world what God is like. I hadn't thought about that story for years. And then two years ago I was preaching in First Baptist Church Hot Springs and there was a family there and it was Kent and his mother and his father and uh, sort of brought back those memories. But it was the right question to ask. Jesus, who's my favorite storyteller, tells three quick stories, all with the same point. Jesus says, suppose one of you were a, she- were a shepherd and you had 100 sheep. And one of those sheep was lost. You would leave the 99 and you would seek that lost sheep. And when you found it, you would pick that lost sheep up, put him over your shoulders, and you would come back. And all of the other fellow shepherds would rejoice with you. And then he gave one sentence of theological interpretation. He says, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. He then tells quickly another story. He said, there is a woman. She had 10 coins, 10 silver coins. She lost one of them. She loses it in the house. She gets a lamp. She probably opens the door. She's looking all over the floor trying to find that one silver coin. She finds the silver coin. And she yells and she's so excited. And all the neighbors came and she says, I found the coin. I found the coin because it was probably much of her wealth. What little she had was in the, was in the coin that she had lost. And she was so excited And Jesus gives a one-sentence interpretation of this. He says, And there will be joy in heaven before the angels for one sinner who repents. Then he tells the third story. He said a father had two sons. One of the sons demanded that uh, he have his inheritance early. And so the father gives in to him and says, okay, here's your share of the inheritance. And the young man takes it and he goes into a far country, meaning another country, a country that didn't understand all of the customs. And it's not long until he loses everything he has. And it says, and there was a drought, which is a way of saying there was a massive downturn in the, the agricultural economy there. And he's wasted his money on prostitutes, according to his brother. And now he's working on a pig farm as a servant. Working in a pig farm for a Jewish boy is like a Baptist boy working in a meth or crack house. It was, it was considered wrong, sinful, and dangerous. And as he is realizing how little he has and how hungry he is, he, he says it comes to his senses. And he has a, has a plan of what he's going to do. He says, I will go home to my father and I will say, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And now I just want to become your servant and that's all I want to do. And so he does that and he goes back home, starts towards home, and his father sees him at a distance. And the father starts running towards him and he welcomes him and he says, get a ring for him, get a robe for him, put sandals on his feet. My son who was dead is now alive. The one who was lost is now found. There's reason to rejoice. And he says... Father, now, yes, yes, but remember, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against against heaven. And instead of discussing all the levels of sin that he had committed, he welcomes him home. And there is an excitement and enthusiasm among all the employees with everyone except the older brother who doesn't even become part of the party and the celebration. And he says, Father, it's not fair. 
Look what you're doing for him. You didn't do anything for me. And the father says, son, everything I have belongs to you. What do you mean it's not fair? Come in and rejoice. The end of the story. Jesus never gives us any theological interpretation to that story. Why is it? It's because all three stories meant exactly the same thing. When Jesus told this story, there were religious leaders who were very embarrassed by how Jesus was acting. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, but here he was associating with sinners and the tax collectors and the kinds of people that that you were embarrassed to be with and they knew that he couldn't be the Son of God and associate with him because that's not what God's like. God is holy and in order to get to know him, you've got to do all of these good deeds and keep the law and do all of these things and hoping that somehow you will make God proud of you in some, in some way. But instead, he's telling the story that God is not like that at all. Because not only did they believe that, but so did the sinners. They didn't believe there was probably anything they could ever do to have God's approval on their life. And so he is describing a different picture of God. First, he's describing a God who seeks the sinner. It is a picture when he describes the father running and greeting the son. It is a picture of God seeking when he shows the shepherd leaving the ninety and nine and going out to find the lost sheep, it is a picture of God, the Father, seeking the sinner. When it is a, when he's telling the story of the lost coin, he is describing God pursuing. God pursues the lost. And how is that to be done today? Through us. We're the body of Christ today. That means that in order for us to fulfill the great commission that we're needing to go and to go beyond our boundaries and go beyond our comfort zone, and we have grown up in a culture that was said church is about you all come, and with the COVID crisis it needs to be about you all go, because that's the call of the great commission where we go out and identify and build relationships and it takes time to build those relationships and build the time so that we can give them the evidence that, that, that God loves them because they look on us and say, you love us. Second, you learn that God sacrificially loves the sinner. Sacrificially. When you look at the story of the prodigal son, the father father has already given the inheritance to the son. He's got to figure out where that inheritance, that second level inheritance is going to come from. When you look on what he's had to give up to provide for his son, he sacrificially loves the son. When you and I go that we must go and give sacrifice, not to please God, because when we sacrificially love, we speak the language of God. I love the the line of Betty Sands, and it was in the, the little booklet that you received this week about Go Love Tell. She said that when asked why that she went, When people would ask, well, why are you doing this for us? She'd say, because the God that I know and the God that I love and serve has placed a love for me, a love for you in my heart. When you and I speak the language of love, we speak the language of God. There's a third truth that's implied in this passage. And that is, we communicate who God is 
when we tell our faith story or we communicate his story when we tell our story. Now that's where often it comes very difficult for us because sometimes we go and we do acts of kindness, but we never get around to telling the story. In one of the churches that I served, on a weeknight I received a phone call from a, a local realtor and he said, I know it's, you're probably home from work, but could you come by and see us this evening? And I had assumed that it was something about church property because I knew he was a realtor. Uh, he knew a little about his reputation in town and, and uh, I knew he had never visited our church. And I said, well, if it could, could we wait till tomorrow? And he says, well, I would really like for you to come tonight. I understand if you can't come tonight, but could you come? Well, I thought, well, it was probably urgent, and I went still assuming it was about some real estate property. I go in, and there's two minutes of small talk, and then he says, you probably wondered why we wanted you here. He says, let me tell you why you're here. He said, we are not natives of this part of the country. He said, we're from a different part of the country. We didn't grow up attending church, any of that. And he says, we've done some bad things. He says, I'm not going to tell you all the bad things that we've done. But he said, my wife and I have moved here to have a new start. So he said, we've started, we've established our own business. It's grown. It's been fairly successful. But says, we've done some bad things while we're here. He said, you know, some of them illegal, but most of them wouldn't be. But says, we we sort of took advantage of some people here and but she said, the reason that you're here tonight is I found out I have a terminal illness. And I'm, uh, I'm not ready to meet God. What do I need to do? Well, I went through the Roman road to salvation. That's where you, you, re, you use four or five verses from the book of Romans to explain how to become a Christian. And I explained it to him, I thought, in the best terms that I knew. And I said, does, does that make sense to you all? And I could tell from the look on his face, he didn't say not really, but that's sort of what he thought. And he says, mm, I guess. So I decided to attempt another version. I used some different passages of Scripture. I used John 3.16. I used the book of Revelation, and I put together the simplest presentation I could. And, and I looked at him again, and I said, does this make sense? He said, well, it's a little better a little bit better. And she looks, he says, well, I think I understand it. He says, well, you've talked about inviting Jesus into your heart, becoming a follower of Christ, different terminology. He says, when did you do that? And uh, I've always been a little bit embarrassed about my salvation story because it's so simple. It's so ordinary. I've occasionally told people that in some ways, it was very disappointing because I thought there would be, you know, all kinds of earth-shaking events when I accepted Christ. But it was just so simple. I said, well, I said, mine's really simple. I was in a church service one night, probably 15 to 20 people there. The preacher was preaching, and I began to feel guilt for not just particular sins, but for the fact that my whole life had been really selfish and that everything I'd done had been primarily about me. And I said, and then my mother, at the, when the invitation was given, she just turned around and said, son, you seem to be emotional. Are you okay? Do you need to go forward? And I said, well, I guess so. And I went forward and knelt before in a little mission setting and asked Christ into my life and believed that he had forgiven me of my sins. And uh, uh, I said, and that was it. I said, it probably is not much help. He says, it is great help. He says, that's sort of our story. He said, I've been feeling guilty for several weeks now about for the way everything in my life has been about me. And he says, and that's caused me to do bad things. And he says, and do you know how I found your name? 
He says, I think God led me to your name. He says, I went in the Yellow Pages. We've never been to your church. And you were the first church listed. And I looked at your name and I called that. And he says, I think that was God calling me to call your name. And he says, and you telling this story. He says, this story helps me understand. It's not about some big wickedness, but it's that self-centeredness in my life. We knelt and prayed, and Sunday morning he came and professed Christ, he and, both he and his wife, and a week later they were baptized. But it was a simple story that I was, didn't think was grand or glorious enough to, to, to share the love of God that connected. When we go... And as Christians and as church members, we need to go wherever God leads us and to realize that we need to reach the people that have been sometimes an embarrassment to us all, and we go reach them, and then we need to love them, build the relationship with them, but eventually we need to tell them. While we're, yes, celebrating building the hospitals and building the churches and, you know, building the schools, all the things that were accomplished in Go Love Tell. Do you realize in heaven there's rejoicing going on? But it's because the people in Maine, the people in Northeast Africa, the people in Tanzania, that some of them have come to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. They come to know that God the Father loves them and wants a relationship with them. That's what the rejoicing in heaven is about. But it requires us to go to love and to tell. We finish with five projects and five countries and five million dollars, but it's basically about one God one son, one story, his story told through us, through our story. Father, help us to keep the mission of Go, Love, Tell going. Even though we may use a different terminology, even though the emphasis is over, Help us to tell your story of what you've done for us so that every man, woman, boy, and girl may have the opportunity to know that you, God the Father, love them. Through Jesus the Son, you have sacrificed for them and that you have invited them to be a part of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.